next up, as I just said, we are going to have a, um, a presentation from, from Randy at HashMap. Um, Randy and I have uh, done a number of things together here over the last couple of months, including I had the, the honor of having Randy interview me on his podcast about, uh, about my uh, life and times here at Snowflake and uh, data and all sorts of really fun, interesting conversations that we had. Uh, but Randy has been writing all sorts of blog posts. He creates, you know, video podcasts. He does a lot of how-to webinars um, on the HashMap site, um, talking about Snowflake and integrating Snowflake with a variety of tools. Uh, today, he is going to take us into a bit of a deep dive on uh, streams and tasks with a... Uh, some example scripts and demos, and uh, maybe some of you at, at, out there in the, uh, the virtual land here may want to even follow along. So introducing our, our data hero here from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Randy. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. Let me, let me share my screen. We can get right into it. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yep, it's showing through. Yes, it is in presentation mode now. Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna show this link here. I'm a big Bitly fan. And if you're interested, you don't have to. It'll still be, I think, hopefully useful if you don't. But this is the link to the script for today. So if you type in uh, bit.ly slash Netflix streams and tasks, um, this will take you to a GitHub gist page where you can grab the SQL and then just jump into Snowflake and we'll work on that. Uh, but first, let me do a bit of an intro. My name is uh, Randy Pitcher and I have wanted to do an intro slide like this, I think, for years. Um, and I've never really had the right audience where I think it made sense. So uh, I'm really excited today to, to have a, a SQL statement to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a I'm technically a regional technical expert at HashMap, but I'm not really regional anymore. And what this means is different to who I'm talking to. So today I'm just a developer, but sometimes I'm a sales engineer and other times I'm a Snowflake admin uh, at HashMap, which is the coolest company. And I have uh, definitely, I think the best job in the world. All my friends hate me for how cool my job is. Um, I have been a Snowflake user since late 2018. Um, so being in consulting, I get the benefit of using lots of tools. And Snowflake just fell into my lap. And I'm so happy that it did. And my favorite Netflix show is BoJack Horseman. Um, it is definitely an underrated show because people think it's just a goofy cartoon, but it's not. Um, and this will come back later. So I'm, I'm not just sharing personal, personal facts. But let's dive into what we're going to actually talk about today. Um, I want to talk about streams and tasks. And we noticed in the transformation section last time, people asked if these are things we can consider for transformation in Snowflake. Um, what I notice often is that people are a little confused about, especially streams, like what, <laughs> what is a stream? Why are they really cool? And how can I use them? Uh, and then tasks, um, I think those make a little more sense, but there might be some things to know about them. We'll then move into the hands-on lab, which is a, a totally made up scenario that I have about Netflix. And then I'll leave you with some closing thoughts and we can do questions. So uh, definitely ask questions throughout and yeah, let's dive in. So um, Snowflake, I think a lot of people are familiar with it for its data transformation, its SQL capabilities, but how can you use it for continuous processing? So first thing is streams. And I am not going to read the, the docs explanation of streams or go under the hood on how they work. That's really interesting. And I would, I would recommend going to check out the great Snowflake docs on this topic, but I wanna provide like a gut feel. How do you think about streams? So first, they're really similar to processing queues. So I think when people hear processing queues, they might think of Kafka. Um, you could use RabbitMQ, you can use any kind of queue structure, but a queue is just a place you put work that needs to be done and then workers to do that work will pull from that queue instead of pulling directly from where the data is. So streams, think of it that way. Uh, that's the best way to really work with them mentally. 
Um, they're queried like a table, which is so, so cool. So if you are working with Kafka, for example, you have data that needs to be processed. You probably have to have some mechanism to pull that data out and parse it with some potentially Python or other languages. And even with um, the Snowflake uh, Kafka connector, there is some amount of like DDL to be done. But if you have a table that's just getting updated regularly and you can create a stream off of it, you can query the exact data from that table plus a ton of bonus fields, just like it is its own table. So stream A here, I select star from, I'll get all the data, all the columns from my underlying table plus some bonus ones. We're gonna talk about this a little later. And they're really useful for efficient CDC processing. Uh, oftentimes you might have a table that's too big to fully reprocess every time you need to update data, you get new data. And it can not always be the simplest thing in the world to find out which data in this table is brand new, especially if you have updates hitting that table. So streams make it really easy to grab just the new data so that you have more efficient processing and you can maybe even process more, more frequently. Um, if at this point you're still like, I don't know what a stream is, that's okay. Streams resist um, understanding until you actually get your hands on them. That's just kind of the nature of streams. And I think it's why docs and charts don't really convey it. We're gonna explain this better in the hands-on lab. Next are tasks. And I think these are a little easier to maybe wrap your head around. Uh, they're just scheduled queries. Um, so they're kind of scheduled like cron jobs uh, where, where you give them a schedule and they will run on that schedule. Um, they run a single query. Uh, so if you need to do something more complex, stored procedures are uh, encouraged, but you can also chain tasks together. So if I have a, a task for loading data, a task for transform, transforming that data, or maybe doing some data quality checks, and then a task for processing that data, I can have those all chain after each other. So when the load is done, it triggers my, my flattening and cleaning uh, task, and then that triggers maybe my data quality checks task. Uh, but they can also, you can just bundle that all together in a single store procedure and use it that way. So these are the main components we're gonna work with today. And let me lay out the scenario a little bit. So I am a huge Netflix fan, not just the content, but the data engineering. And I, uh, I'm pretty sure Netflix has spoken publicly about their Snowflake usage and the things they do. So I thought it'd be fun to come up with a interesting use case for like quote unquote Netflix data. Uh, our scenario is that we have streaming data coming in and it's semi-structured. So it's kind of in a JSON format and it's just event data. It arrives continuously. It's just constantly coming in. It's getting loaded, maybe with Snowpipe in our scenario. And our problem is we want to build a ratings table. So some of this data includes ratings from devices. And you can imagine like we have cell phones, tablets, we have Chromecast, laptops, all these different devices just streaming tons of event information into this space. So we want to grab just the event data we care about and maybe combine that with a reference table that has a bunch of metadata about individual Netflix shows. Because for event IoT kind of data, you want to make that package as small as possible. So you'll use like a show ID. Uh, and the question is, how can I process only the new review events to create a show reviews table with show details from that reference table? Basically, how do I build an analytics friendly view of my streaming events of rating on Netflix? Right, and I, I know they have the thumbs up, thumbs down. In our scenario, we're gonna maybe use a 10 point scale uh, and compare that. And again, you can check out bit.ly slash Netflix streams and tasks, and that is where our code will be. So I'm gonna jump out of my slides here. We're gonna go off road. And if you clicked on this, this is what it looks like. Um, we have just a few fields that we need to fill in. Uh, so you'll need a role that can uh, create a schema in a specific database and can use this warehouse. Uh, other than that, you should be good to go. So if you wanted to copy this, go to raw, uh, control all and copy. Um, I already have mine pasted though. So in here, and I filled in my specific roles. So RTE, remember that's my job title. Um, I have a dedicated warehouse for myself and I created a, a database the other day for Snowflake Group Buy. So that's right here. Um, we're going to run through this line by line. So if you don't have uh, Snowflake up, don't feel like you're missing out. 
I think you'll still get value out of this. So first thing we're gonna do is set our context. Uh, hopefully you've had a second to fill this in. I'm not leaving you too far behind. Uh, and so I'm gonna use role RTE, warehouse RTE, and then use this database. Uh, if I refresh here, the database is empty right now, just an information schema. It technically has public in there, but um, my role doesn't have access to public. And we're gonna start creating some tables. So these are the three core tables we care about for this scenario. The one is just the events. So they're called rating events, but we have kind of a mix of things coming in here. And they're just gonna be a variant type. Okay, let me use schema. So hopefully for you, you didn't have to have the or replace where it would uh, use, lose that for you. Oh man, of course, this is my nightmare. Oh, did I not create it? Excuse me. Okay, uh, so now it exists. Let's create or replace this table. Great, and if I refresh, I should be able to see this Netflix streams and tasks uh, schema and this table, the Netflix rating uh, events. So it's just gonna be raw data variants, totally unstructured, no schema uh, here. And then we'll create this Netflix ratings table. This is our end result table where we'll have the show ID, the title for the show, and then an actual rating. So over time, we could build out some kind of dashboard that will show us the best show on Netflix or the most highly rated show. And then the last uh, table here is really our metadata table, kind of a reference table for Netflix shows. And this will take an ID that we have maybe from our, our ratings events and then give us the title of a show. So if I refresh over here, we can see we have Netflix ratings, Netflix rating events and Netflix shows. Uh, first thing I wanna do is fill in this reference table uh, with some shows. These are shows I like on Netflix uh, and giving them um, some IDs. I did want to point out uh, Bojack Horseman actually is um, the best show on Netflix. So that's that's interesting to know right up front. And we'll, we'll experiment today to see if it's also the most highly rated uh, show on Netflix. So we've created that. And if I just take a peek over here at Netflix shows, we have seven rows and in a preview. This is what the data looks like. We have these IDs and the, the show title. Uh, so next step, let's create some streams. So remember, we're here to learn about streams and tasks. And I have found by far the best way to learn about streams is to create two of them and screw around with one of them. By seeing how stream A changes compared to stream B, you're going to start to get an understanding of why these are useful and, and why they're, they're powerful to use. I also want to convey like streams, they're not scary. They're not as scary as they seem. So if you have tables that change, go ahead and create a stream on top of one of them in your own time. And then you can play around with that stream. It will not impact the underlying table that you're working on. Uh, and it won't duplicate data storage. There's some additional data storage for the metadata, but you can create a stream and play around with it and get a feel for it without breaking your existing pipelines. So I'm gonna create stream A and stream B. And then I'll use this nifty uh, command to basically just list my streams. And here they are, they're both in the schema. Um, if you're not familiar, they won't actually show up visually here. So you'll wanna get familiar with the show uh, family of commands. And great, they work, they're delta types. There's a lot of configuration you can do on top of these that for your specific use case um, is worth checking out. So go ahead and look at the create stream documentation for your specific use cases. So let's start modifying some tables. Um, we created this on top of the ratings event. So right now, if I just select star from A and B, they're empty. Perfect. And you'll see that the schema though has raw data, which matches exactly our, our ratings schema. Sorry, rating is events schema, just raw data. But we also have these metadata columns. The action is update and the row ID. So let's go ahead and insert some data and I'm gonna insert a rating. This is maybe what um, a, a rating event could look like coming in from our streaming devices. And show ID is zero and rating is 10. So someone rated, whatever show um, has ID zero, they rated it 10. We don't really know what show that is though. So we've inserted that as JSON. So if I go ahead and preview, it looks like this. 
great, nice compact uh, JSON data. And now let's look at our streams. How have they changed? Remember they were empty before. So now, almost exactly like when I queried the table, I have my column here. And I can manipulate this column any way I want in my select statement. I can dive into these fields. I can do some operations on top of this. Um, but I also have some really critical information about what change occurred to create this. Um, the action was an insert, which corresponds to this. Uh, update means, no, this was not an update. It is a net new addition. And the row ID, which is a hidden field, usually uniquely identifies this row over time. So if I had an update, I could use this row idea to match it to maybe previous values. Um, stream B, if I were to preview that, looks the same. Okay, great. So right now, uh, we have added a field to this table and our streams are showing that this field exists. So let's process that field manually. But instead of doing an insert on top of the table, I'm gonna do it on top of the stream. So it should be the same data, but we're gonna see how things change. So my insert logic is to select the show ID, the title, and the rating from the join of my stream A, my Netflix shows, right order join on stream A, where the ID of the show is equal to the, um, the stream A, the, the raw data's ID right here. And we're accessing that semi-structured. So let me run this really quickly. Because I'm curious, that show with ID zero and rating 10, 10 is perfect in our scenario. What show was that? So let's go into our actual ratings here, which is our clean BI ready table and preview the data. Okay, my goodness, it's, um, it's Bojack Horseman and it does have a rating of 10, that's a perfect score. Uh, so we have processed data from a stream. And up till now you might be thinking like, why did I need a stream for that? Because I could have just done that on my Netflix ratings um, event table. But here's where streams really start to get interesting. If we look at the state of stream, the stream A right now, and maybe you can guess what I'm gonna show you, it's different. We haven't modified stream A, we've only read from it. But if I look at stream A, it is empty. And this means, for example, I could run this query over and over and never get duplicate data. I'll run it again. No error. And then if I preview in my end results, I don't have a duplicate. This is really interesting because usually if I ran it against this table, I would have a duplicate because I'm just inserting. And I'm not doing any sort of like new data check. I don't have a watermark. I'm not doing any predicates. I'm just doing a much more simple to write, which means simpler to maintain unless error prone, insert statement against this stream. Now stream B on the other hand, I did not read from it. So if I select here, it's still there. And something you might be wondering is why is stream B not empty every time I mess with it? The reason is even though we are reading from stream A and stream B, if we don't do any inserts or data modification with the results, the stream will not flush itself out. It's only when we do an insert command or create table as command, we do these data modifications where the stream results that were used get flushed from the stream. So this makes it really easy for me to create a stream, examine the data that's in there, decide what a good processing logic uh, approach would be for me, and then only at that point do I start flushing data out of the stream. Uh, this is really, really useful if, for example, network, the, the ratings events are coming in nonstop. And if you can see from the data, in my scenario, there's no way to identify a new record off the bat. There's no like timestamp, there's no um, other kind of watermark uh, to use. So this becomes really powerful. Let's insert a couple more ratings here. So show ID one and show ID two. Um, and now we've had some reading from the stream. We've had some inserts to the underlying table. Let's see how things change. I'm gonna start with stream B because this is the record of things that have changed that we haven't processed yet. And so we have them not really in a particular uh, order here of the, the two new records I've added plus the original one I had. They're all inserts, none of them are updates and the row IDs here give us that information. Stream A, however, remember I processed show ID zero, that first record we had. So when I show this, it only has those two new records. Um, 
I am super jazzed and excited about this. If you followed me up to this point, you understand the core of what a stream is and why it's valuable for processing. Um, your exploratory joins that you might run to get a feel for how to process data now become powerful enough once you point them to a stream to be production transformation tools. You don't have to rewrite your logic to accommodate for like data change capture uh, events. So now let's insert just like we did before into show A using the same logic where we're going to grab show ID one and two. We process that. Let's preview these ratings. Okay, Ozark and Master of None. Um, we've got 10, 9, 8 for the ratings. They have been processed. I can run this again, just like before, and not have to worry about duplicate records. This is really powerful, and I haven't had to do any sort of additional logic for that. And now again, when we look at stream A and B, stream A has uh, nothing, and then stream B, of course, has those three records. Um, so that's great for append-only stuff, but what if we deleted uh, a record? We found that a rating was fraudulent uh, somewhere. Um, or, or here, we're just going to delete all the ratings. Uh, now I look in my rating events. They're empty. And this is where things get super interesting. Um, stream A is maybe what you would have guessed. Our events are here, but they're deletes. So I can see for this row ID, they've been deleted. And I might have a secondary processing flow, one to insert where I might add this metadata row ID. And then here I can look for deletes on the stream and delete from my end result table where the row ID is equal to the deleted row ID. Uh, that's maybe a mouthful. Uh, I didn't do that here, but you can start to imagine where the possibilities start to get more nuanced for real world use cases. Now stream B, Hold on to your hats here. Stream B is empty. This is some sophistication, and it's where you can start to save some real money. For high churn tables where events are added, created, updated, anything like that, the streams are going to collapse unprocessed changes that would cancel each other out. So if we had those three records get added and then three records get removed before our processing logic came through, we would show no data to process, which would save us from spending compute to process records to insert them when we would just have to delete them a second later. This is really powerful and it's something that would be hard to implement by hand. I think a lot of us have built this kind of logic on our own. So that's a stream. We have our streams in place, but I don't wanna run this command manually. I can just log in every hour and give it a run. Let's automate this, right? And Snowflake right built in has tasks just for this. And the task integration with streams makes this really easy. So I'm gonna create or replace a task. In your copy, you're gonna to have to provide a different warehouse because you'll need one. So tasks are assigned a warehouse to run with and I'm gonna name it Netflix Ratings Event Processor. The schedule I'm using is just running it as frequently as you can, um, which is every minute in Snowflake, which is not always an appropriate fit for everyone. Don't just default to this, uh, but in our situation, it's a good thing. And um, it's when the system, so I have a predicate here, it's only gonna run and fire up the warehouse when this stream has data. So that's really powerful for me, especially when I have the collapsing behavior. So I can avoid even turning on the task when there's no data to process. This costs no compute for me. And you'll recall our insert, it's the same insert as above. So I am going to create that task. Now tasks, when they're created, they're off. So you have to resume them. Uh, this is to avoid you just spending a ton of money on accident uh, when you mean to. So let's activate the task. Every minute, this is going to check for new data and process it. So let's really quickly add a bunch of new records. And important to note here, I've thrown in a non-conforming schema. So this is platform 9.75, uh, which is not a show rating. Who knows what that means? Uh, will we be able to accommodate this weird piece of... of uh, of data. So I will really quickly uh, preview in our ratings. I'll just run over and over here. We have those originals from before. Remember, I didn't delete them, but we're expecting a couple more. So this is always the most uh, scary part of this presentation, because if I hit the timing wrong, um, we could wait 60 seconds or more. 
Uh, so I'll give that a second. And then when this data is populated, we're gonna really quickly see what the best uh, rated show is on Netflix. I'm excited to see what that tells us. Okay, look, without doing anything manual, I've just waited for the task to run. All of these new uh, ratings have been added to the system. Uh, they've been processed and this will continue processing without me having to work with it. And in real life, we actually do our own snow, uh, Snowflake security monitoring on top of CloudTrail logs using this. So this is something I've set up, I wanna say last summer and I haven't had to touch in a year now. Uh, that's how reliable these, these pipelines can be. So let's real quick select the show title and the average rating from our Netflix ratings table uh, grouped by the show title and uh, order by descending ratings, limit one. So what is the best show on Netflix? Oh, that, I can't believe it. It is BoJack Horseman again. Uh, it's the best show. It's also the most highly rated show on Netflix. So please do check out uh, BoJack Horseman while you're checking out streams and tasks. Put it on in the background uh, while you're developing. Uh, and that's kind of the demo. I'm gonna clean this up. You can clean these up too uh, if you wish, though you'll be fine. Normally a task would run and just run a warehouse nonstop, but because we have this really cool stream catch, it won't bill you anything if you don't add more data to the Netflix space. So I'll clean this up. And um, if you're interested, now nah, I'll save that for later. Let's jump back into the slides. I have just a few closing thoughts and then we'll open it up to uh, questions. Uh, first, streams. Uh, they're really, really useful if you're doing non-append only operations on tables directly in Snowflake. So you would have maybe a billion record transactions table that has updates hitting it directly. It has some deletes, it has all that. Um, this can be a really efficient way to process that. I also wanna encourage you to check out change tracking. So this is something you can enable on top of a table that doesn't have the same flushing behavior of streams. And for some people, it gives you the benefits of tracking the metadata that we saw before without having to keep in mind like how a stream will flush or not flush or, or deal with that state. So change tracking is really a really cool feature. You just alter the table to enable that. Um, use append only data ingestion where possible. This is just some advice. So if you're in a scenario where you do have a table like this that's getting updated often and needs to be reprocessed, look at maybe just append only and then doing some reconciliation on the Snowflake side. I've seen that this works a lot better in my experience and it's less prone to error than some of these other like change tracking only approaches. And if you're having trouble um, identifying those, when you do ingest, um, add an ingestion time, uh, just using current timestamp. And this allows you to kind of window your, um, your data changes. Uh, and then you can at any point in time see what the data would have looked like a year ago if you're using this. So this is snapshotting. I'll see a lot of people um, do it this way, the kind of more hard way, and then after the fact, try to implement snapshotting when really it would just be easy to ingest in a snapshot fashion. Um, next, our tasks. Tasks are awesome and they could be a little bit better, honestly. Um, monitoring is really a place where they could be a little bit simpler and for Internally at HashMap, um, this is something I was gonna share. We actually monitor with uh, the Snowflake metadata. So Snowflake exposes your account usage data um, directly to you for use any way you like. And so we have here in some of our other monitoring, we have our runtimes by task. And the Netflix ratings event is really low, but that cloud trail flattening task I showed you, or I mentioned, uh, we've been running it forever. So this is, I think, the last 30 days of usage, and you can see spikes and median run times, uh, which approximate to cost. And I have this running really consistently. So anytime there's new data to process, I process it right away. So that's cool. If you want to do something more advanced or really try to correlate this exactly to dollars, um, there are ways to do that. You should definitely check out uh, the hash mapping blog where we talk about some of that stuff more in depth. Um, one thing to know about a, a task, and I learned this um, trying to do administrative stuff in a task, um, all, tasks always turn on a warehouse. So even if your SQL operation doesn't need a warehouse, like you're gonna create a user, for example, it will invariably turn on a warehouse. So be aware of that. And I personally would love a, a future where a task could be powered by like a serverless compute layer where you wouldn't have the 60 second minimum billing um, I think that would be super cool. And I love that SoPipe++ Plus Plus, uh, does that for ingestion and will scale up. Um, I think that would be a natural extension. So that's something I wanted to share to the Snowflake people. 
And thank you. That's all I had. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions now. All right. Well, thank you. That was, you jammed a lot of information there into uh, that session. Um, I think people are going to have to rewatch your session a couple of times. Uh, I think another thing worth pointing out is you, you did a webinar, I think last month or so on uh, streams and tasks where you talked about some of the other aspects of it. So you may want to share the link for that as well in the, uh, in the chat with everyone. Sure. So a uh, bunch of questions. We're not going to be able to go through all of them. So I'll let you answer some of them um, in the Q&A after. How do streams work if we truncate and load the same data? Yeah, that's interesting. So um, the truncate operation shows as deletes in the streams. So if you truncate everything and then reload everything, I think they'll be treated as totally different um, records. Whereas if you just were to uh, modify or update, they would maintain the history across. So if you did an upsert, for example, um, the thing with streams, it, it's kind of mentally confusing for me too, uh, even though I, I use them, give it a try. It, it doesn't really take much to just fire one up and modify an underlying table to experiment a little bit. And then of course the docs have a lot more information. So I'll be the first to admit, I don't have all the non-append only uh, behavior for streams memorized. I personally will only use streams in an, in an append only fashion. Good question. All right, I think you answered this one. Does this work on traditional non-variant data types where data is being inserted or updated? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the, the interesting part was is that you actually showed, before anybody asked, can you do this with semi-structured data like JSON? And you actually showed that, which is a, a, a very unique feature across, uh, across many systems. Uh, let's see. Okay, one more. If we schedule a task for every minute, is it going to charge for warehouse even though there is no data to update? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Usually, if you don't put in this little part here, let me show you. Man, let me get rid of this Zoom thing. Uh, in the SQL, we, we do a thing where what the stream has data to run. In that scenario that we've done, it will not charge you. It won't run until there's data to process. But if you're not using a stream and you have a task that's gonna be looking for other things to run against right now, Yes, it'll run nonstop. So if you have it every minute, you'll just be running that warehouse all the time. So that's something to look out for because it can be an easy way to um, spike your billing without realizing it. Good, 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 good question and answer, an important one. Well, thank you very much, Randy. Uh